Hey there, welcome back to High Infidelity, the best channel for cheating stories. Like and subscribe to the channel for more spicy stories. Now, let's get into today's story video. Found my girlfriend cheating on me with my close friend. I have him arrested and ghosted her. Backstory. My wife Rachel and I grew up in a medium-sized town with a population of about 30,000 people. We met when we were little, approximately six or seven, I can't remember exactly. We were almost inseparable. We began dating when we were 16 years old. We went out for employment when we were 18, to a city just a few hours away. We were married and had purchased our first home before the age of 20. We found out she was pregnant with a son when she was 22. Then, catastrophe hit. A massive shelving unit fell and crushed her around five weeks before she was set to go on maternity leave. Both she and our kid were murdered instantaneously, according to what I was informed. Two of her co-workers had also been wounded in the accident, one of whom was paraplegic and the other who had to have his leg amputated. In order to save money, the firm she worked for opted to keep using old shelving that had been written off as hazardous rather than replace it. I still haven't forgiven the executives and management employees who made that choice, since they killed the love of my life while also terminating our pregnancy. It wasn't long after that I was informed I had an option about how to continue with what her firm termed compensation, but I referred to it as blood money. They hoped to avoid a lawsuit by settling out of court. In contrast, I was out for their blood. Just to be clear, this is not the vengeance, it is still background. Fortunately, because of the media attention and the involvement of various politicians, the issue was resolved promptly in court, approximately three years, with a settlement for all parties that was close to ten times the amount that they had first promised. They were fined heavily for violations of work, health and safety regulations, executives were fired, others were imprisoned and so on. Perhaps a tale for another time, when I feel more at ease telling it. I was still working in telecommunications at the time. My mother, bless her soul, had moved in to assist me while all of this was going on. I suppose I would have broken down if she hadn't been so interested. Around this time, I was given a promotion, but it required extensive travel around the state. I asked for an office in my hometown's branch because I wanted to take care of companies not only in the state but also in my hometown, where there was no business representative, and they agreed. We got into a schedule of one to two weeks in the city office, one week in my hometown, and one to two weeks during the rest of the state after a few months. After a year, I decided to purchase a home in my hometown so that I wouldn't have to remain at my parents' house every week or so that I was home and could come and go as I pleased. This is significant later in the plot. Our narrative starts around four years later. Sorry for the lengthy history. On Friday, I had just returned from one of my excursions and was checking in some items at my office when Harry, the branch's managing director, stepped in. We had grown up together as well, but had gone to separate schools, but had built a really strong connection since returning. He inquired as to how things were doing and then invited me to a home party he was throwing that evening. Even with the short notice, I said sure. I felt like a couple with pals were in order. That's where Harry introduced me to Catherine. She was a new recruit at the branch where my hometown's office was situated, and she was still getting to know everyone since she was new in town. We hit it off right away. As corny as that may seem, it was almost as if Rachel were in front of me instead of Catherine. I won't go into too many specifics, but after two years of dating, we decided to take the next step, and she moved into my hometown's house. Everything had been going swimmingly up until this moment. Catherine and my parents got along and Rachel's parents were pleased that someone could make me as happy as Rachel had. Things had been going smoothly for over a year when things started to shift. Skype chats were abruptly cut short neighbors would tell me how a vehicle, reported to me as Harry's, was constantly spotted parked in a back alley near my home while I was gone, and some clothing that weren't mine were in my closet. All indications led to her infidelity, but she claimed that nothing was going on. She said that Harry would drop over on occasion to talk business, but he never remained the night. I put it up to paranoia and carried on as if nothing was wrong, but there was always this nagging sensation that something wasn't quite right. It was over six months later that I found she had been deceiving me. I had recently negotiated a rather significant deal with a new firm, and the discussions had concluded sooner than I had expected. So, rather than staying for a few more days, I decided to book an early trip home and surprise everyone. After a few hours, I drove into my hometown and into the alley behind my house, 
hoping to sneak into Catherine's house and surprise her. However, I was interested to see whether this mysterious automobile was present. There was, indeed, a vehicle obstructing the rear entry gate. I was perplexed for a second, wondering whether it had been a careless neighbor who had parked, only to find it was Harry's vehicle. I may have drove right past my own house if it hadn't been for the thick hedge line I'd installed a few years ago for seclusion. I stepped out of my vehicle after pulling up behind his automobile and felt it was odd that he was there so late. As she said, he had always departed by now. As I got closer to the rear of the home, I saw something that made my stomach sink. Catherine and Harry were hammering it out in my kitchen. I went completely still. Time stood still. My close buddy was having with my girlfriend on my kitchen bench. I had no idea what to do. So many thoughts raced through my mind. Was I dreaming or was I awake? What was the point of them having in my house? Feeling discouraged, I turned and walked away without anyone noticing. For what seemed like an eternity, I sat in my vehicle. I was in tears, hard. However, the melancholy immediately evolved to rage. The same type of rage I felt for those responsible for Rachel's death. I wanted to inflict pain on them, badly. I am a pacifist who does not believe in violence. I knew then that I was going to punish them and ruin their life. And what better time to get started than right now? I drove back up the alley, far enough away from my driveway to see Harry's vehicle, and then went back to the gate, where I could see inside the house, and dialed her phone. They were still going for it when the phone rang. When my name appeared on the caller ID, they both performed a double take. I could see she was thinking about answering it, so they let it ring. They were back into it after a few seconds, and I phoned once more. She did respond this time. I hung up while she was replying and returned to my vehicle. She phoned me back as soon as I did. She inquired why I was phoning so late, and I said that I was about ten minutes away from home and didn't want to frighten her away by coming in. She was definitely surprised and seemed pleased that I was coming, and the conversation ended abruptly when she stated she was going to get up and change into something. I said my goodbyes and hung up the phone. A few seconds later, Harry walked through the gate, still half-nude, and leaped into his vehicle, speeding away like a bat out of hell. I grinned a bit, knowing how terrified both of them would be at the prospect of being apprehended. I waited a few seconds before driving into the exact spot where Harry had been moments before. The rest of the night was very quiet, and I didn't get up until she was sleeping to go to my office down the hall. I couldn't get to sleep. I needed to make a plan, and I made a plan. My mother always encouraged me to be a pacifist and to let cosmic karma take its course. But on this particular instance, I concluded that karma might use some assistance. I planned to punish them both individually, but to destroy them both. I was aware that Harry had a drug problem. It wasn't anything important, but he kept it extremely quiet. I only found out about it by mistake after finding some coke and cannabis left out at his home, but I claimed I hadn't seen it when he tried to cover it up. I started filming some of my more shady clients and making some subtle inquiries about collecting some samples that they were willing to part with. After a few days, I acquired a large enough cash to make my strategy work. A month later, I hosted friends around for a barbecue night, including Harry. I urged Harry to remain the night and sleep it off after ensuring that I had adequately liquored him up. In the early hours of that morning, I took the narcotics and a variety of my personal stuff and hid them in different locations around his vehicle the largest amount being in his tire well. I secured the vehicle and went inside to sleep, certain that he wouldn't discover them during the next several months while the remainder of my plan took effect. After bringing him home, I also left some additional drugs and personal stuff in his house since he was still too inebriated to drive. I faked a break in a few days later by shattering the rear glass of my back door into my kitchen and left it open before returning to the city for a flight. I received many mails as soon as I arrived. One from my plainly worried mother, who had discovered the damaged back door and contacted the cops. One from Catherine in tears, and one from the local cops requesting me to call. After receiving all of the calls, I notified the cops that I was away on business and would return the following week to speak with them. While I was gone, I requested Catherine to remain with my parents until I returned and I urged my father to arrange for one of the local security firms to install cameras and an alarm system after receiving permission from the police, so that the crime scene would not be ruined. When I got home, I went through my usual me god, I can't believe this has occurred and why would someone do this? Routine. After thoroughly searching every room, discovering that the goods I had stolen were missing, and making a police complaint, 
I had the security company's representative walk Catherine and me through how the cameras and alarm system operated. Then came the inquiry I had been anticipating. What happens if we are doing business and do not want it recorded? She pretended to be bashful when she asked this inquiry, but I understood precisely why she was questioning me. He informed us that this was a common concern, and we were taught on the home computer, if we wanted to do things without being filmed, how to disable the recording for certain cameras, so that we could preserve her modesty. As I was leading him out, I asked him whether, if the cameras were turned off, a notice might be sent out as a security measure. He came back in and walked me through the process of setting up email alerts before leaving. Fantastic. All I had to do was sit and wait. At this point, I asked our slash legal advice for assistance with couples law in my country. I wanted to make sure that my forthcoming plan was legal and that I wouldn't be compelled to give Catherine any money or equity since I didn't know whether we were considered a de facto couple or not. As the single recipient of Rachel's inheritance, I didn't want to be left with any unpleasant surprises in which Catherine might take any portion of the fortune away from me. Shout out to those guys and gals there for putting me in touch with a great lawyer who assured me that because we hadn't been living together long enough to be classified as de facto, and because I was paying all the utilities on the property she was living in and didn't pay rent, she had no legal standing to make a financial claim against me. To be sure, he wrote out what I thought was a very solid legal document, just in case there was any legal problem. The following week, my boss approached me and offered me a promotion to return to the city and run the team that I was a part of, which meant I wouldn't have to travel as much and be in one place as much, and that due to the success of being in my hometown, they were considering having three to five representatives spend one to two weeks in the larger surrounding towns, including my hometown, as a part of my team. I said yes and started the process of starting my transfer, which would take around six weeks. Perfect. I had more than enough time to collect all of my proof. When I returned to my hometown the next week, I started to put the remainder of my plan into action. I requested Harry to allow one week of vacation for Catherine for the next two weeks. I planned to take were and a few of friends on a retreat before making the greatest choice of my life for the second time. He sprang up and gave me a big embrace, complimenting me for being brave enough to try again. I embraced him back, but not in the manner I believe he envisioned at the moment. He agreed and reserved the whole week for me. I requested him not to tell anybody, since I wanted to keep it as a surprise as possible. I knew it would spread like wildfire across the workplace, but that was my intention. That night, I informed Catherine that I had booked her and two friends a week stay at a tropical spa resort, with all costs covered. No questions asked, she chooses two buddies and returns to the greatest surprise of her life. She yelled like a child who had just been informed that she could have all the chocolates in the store. I then told her that I was going to spend the following week in the city, preparing for a large client who was one of my biggest accounts and needed some people on. My team to help before flying out the following week and I wouldn't be home until the Monday she was leaving, so I wouldn't be able to see her, which seemed to disappoint her, but I told her it would be worth it when she returned. What I didn't tell her was that I'd opted to take a two-week vacation to the other side of the country, mentally preparing myself for that that was going to explode the minute she set foot on the aircraft and relishing my first taste of freedom. Two weeks later, on a Sunday, I flew back and started driving home. When I arrived, I did a fast pass by my home and, sure enough, Harry's vehicle was there. I parked a little farther back, like I had done the first night I had captured them, and checked the cameras. I'm fast asleep in my bed. To be honest, it was no surprise since I had often filmed them doing this over my two-week absence. I immediately made my first call to the police, which was blocked by my caller ID. I told them that I was one of their neighbors, and that I had seen someone hanging out in their car in the alley behind my house, occasionally passing something through windows to passing cars while also looking into my yard and that I was concerned that they were dealing drugs or planning to break into someone's property. I provided them his license plate number and a description of him. They stated someone will be there in a few minutes, so I thanked them and hung up. I immediately contacted Catherine and told her I was about 10 minutes away and that I knew she was leaving the next day, but urgently wanted to surprise her. Looking back at the clip, I giggle at the noise I was shocked I didn't hear. Harry was half-dressed and dashing out the back door to his vehicle in a matter of seconds. I couldn't have wished for a more ideal scenario at that time. As Harry was driving away, one of the police vehicles turned the corner behind me, spotted Harry driving away quickly, and pursued him. She fell asleep again after pulling in, greeting a happy Catherine, 
and performing the couple of things. I, on the other hand, couldn't get a wink of sleep. Her and her companions were packed into a vehicle the following day. I had to wait a few hours after they drove gone before I could start carrying out my plan. I phoned a removalist acquaintance and apologized for the late notice, but I wanted my home packed and relocated on Friday. After we agreed on a time, I informed him that he would need to transport some boxes to a storage facility, which he said would not be a problem. Then I started packing Catherine's things. Later that day, I received a call from the police asking me to come and identify some goods that had been captured from a suspect the night before and match the description of the items I had reported stolen. I smiled to myself, pleased that my plan for Harry had come to reality, and answered that I will be there immediately to pick it up. Of course, when I arrived, some of the goods were still missing, owing to the fact that they had to be at his home and they hadn't checked there yet. The town was bustling with news at this point. My hometown's events don't remain hidden for long. Harry was shamed and swiftly dismissed for his possession of narcotics and stolen goods, and our respective supervisors had tendered a formal apology to me on behalf of the firm earlier in the week. That night, I went to my parents' home and informed both my and Rachel's parents what had occurred, omitting important specifics, and that I was going back to the city after getting promoted. But Catherine wouldn't be there. They were unhappy at first because I hadn't told them what was going on, but they were relieved that I was handling things maturely and hadn't gone to their level even if they didn't agree with ghosting Catherine. But I went home after a few beers, laughter, and tears. After a hectic week of coordinating cleaners for the next week, real estate to put my property on the rental market, and numerous other responsibilities at my hometown's office, I packed some items into my vehicle and traveled to my parents' house where I bid farewell before the journey. I went to Becky's residence before leaving. Becky had been one of Rachel's closest pals since she was a child. She was the only other person who knew what was going on, sans the information about Harry. I couldn't have organized things as fast as I did without her assistance. I handed Becky a thick manila folder with all of my proof of her infidelity, as well as a letter and a few other legal paperwork from my attorney indicating that she was ordered not to contact me and instructions on how to get her items at the storage facility I had leased out. I said my goodbyes and traveled back to the city. I awoke on Sunday to multiple missed calls, voice messages, and text messages. Catherine had returned home early after being warned of something going on in town, only to discover an empty house with a for rent sign out front. She had gone to my parents' house, freaked out, and they had locked the door on her the instant she responded, causing her to ring everyone until she was reached by Becky and informed that she had a package for her. I was informed she didn't take well to that which I already knew based on her several furious emails and phone calls accusing me of setting up Harry, being deceptive, and so forth. I was afraid she'd show up at my front door, but nothing happened. I'm writing this for you, dear reader, five weeks after I left and was promoted. Granted, it's lengthy, and it took a few rewrites to get it down from my original 14 pages, which is nearly twice the length of this narrative, but I believe that most of what I stated was relevant enough for the story. Edit. Obligatory thank you and, holy cow, this went viral. Thank you for gilding this account, even if it is a one-time use account that I will not use again. I'm still at work right now, but after I'm done, I'll answer as many inquiries as I can and offer any additional updates that come my way. Second revision, so I'm home now, and with the amount of questions here, as well as other comments and messages, I decided to take the time to address questions and offer some explanation here, rather than replying to everyone. So one of the topics I'm often asked is what happened to Harry, why I was so harsh on him, and why I would implicate myself, particularly on the internet. After speaking with some friends back home, the simple answer is that Harry is facing a few months in jail, since it's his first offense, but he might get out sooner, and I thought that it was vital to the plot. No one knew what I had planned for Harry, which is why I omitted a few crucial details that could have truly identified me as well as changed up some of the descriptive language about locations to potentially place this story anywhere in the world. To clarify, there was already more than enough proof in his own house. I only offered a mechanism for the authorities to further examine his conduct in his own home. That being said, I don't regret what I did to him since he grew up with both Rachel and me and saw how difficult it was for me to pick up my life after she died. For anyone wondering whether I'm afraid about Harry finding out and reporting me to the authorities, I know he doesn't use Reddit. I know Catherine has an account, but I haven't noticed any recent activity to indicate that she hasn't been online in a while. Who knows about other Reddit users? 
Most of the people I'm friends with on my primary account could recognize this tale if they come across it, but I don't know about their surfing habits outside of the subreddits that we visit. People have asked why I didn't do more for Catherine or why I stayed around for as long as I did. I nearly sent her out after a few days, but I wanted to collect evidence and exhibit proof of her infidelity so that everyone she knew understood what she had done. She is a major socialite in her words, and I knew that exposing her would ruin her reputation. In terms of what happened to her, I've been informed that she recently relocated to another state after getting transferred. According to the people I've spoken with today, she was primarily assigned administrative duties prior to her transfer, as there was quite a bit of backlash after the rumor mill spread throughout town. People have questioned the legality of what I did to her, such as transferring all of her belongings, sending her and several friends away, spending a significant amount of money on the trip and so on. Morally, I think it's a bad move to build up her expectations of what she imagined would happen. This, along with destroying her reputation in town, was my ultimate goal, to give her a taste of what it felt like to have everything come apart around you. But from a legal standpoint, I was perfectly justified. She had never updated any of her personal information, driver's license, voting registration, etc., to reflect that she had moved into my home throughout the period she had been living with me. After speaking with r legal, I discovered this information over the course of my preparation with my lawyer. I was allowed to accomplish what I did since there was no real evidence on paper that she was dwelling there, and because we hadn't fulfilled the de facto status. Finally, for those of you who claim that my narrative is fabricated, that I am a karma, a sociopath in this day and age, who doesn't have some sociopathic tendencies, and that my malicious compliance tale is also evidence, I will be honest and say that I will not attempt to alter your thoughts on this. Everyone has the right to an opinion on tales published on Reddit, as well as an opinion on people who share them. The plot on the other subreddit, on the other hand, was to gain karma, since my first post on r slash pro needed me to build up enough before they would allow me to post because that suspected I was a bot. That narrative, which I just trimmed in the gist of the discussion, since I can't recall everything, did in fact happen and received national attention soon after. If I ever find the article, I'll post a link to it because it was or was close to being one of the largest roaming bills our company had ever passed on to a customer. Thank you for your time.